So my name is Boon Lim, I'm a consultant cardiologist. It's the 1st of November 2023 and today I have a patient with me. Uh, can I say your name? Yes. Lucy. Uh, Lucy is 47 and she's a patient who has struggled somewhat with the diagnosis of atlas Danlos syndrome hypermobility type, uh, which means her joints are fairly hypermobile and she may be susceptible or have susceptibility to dislocations, twisting, joint injuries. but the narrative I want to take forwards for Lucy is something she may or may not have heard before, but I'm saying it for the first time, which I think could be helpful in setting the scene for how we can move forwards. Um, so I'll start by saying, or maybe asking Lucy a question. Have you ever felt well? When was the last time you felt normal? Was it as a child? Was it when you were 8, 13, 18, 20? Probably mid-twenties. Mid-twenties. You were feeling normal in your mid-twenties. Yes. And so as a child, completely normal childhood? Uh, yeah. You didn't yeah. twist your ankles or...? Uh, I used to faint. I used to get exhausted. Right. But and that... Was shoes, Lucy? Ah, yes. When I was 14, endometriosis. Okay, that's when it started. And... Okay. So I'm going to pick up on a narrative which which I know you've maybe not heard before, but may be relevant for some of you listening here. And it's to do with ehlers danlos Syndrome and how that can provoke a dysautonomic profile. And dysautonomia is where we have a disorder of the autonomic nervous system, which is that bit of the brain that controls your fright or flight response on the one hand, which is mediated by the sympathetic nervous system that really makes you full of adrenaline, cortisol, ready to fight or flight. And on the contrasting side, the rest and digest or the parasympathetic nervous system mediated by the vagus. And the narrative here is this. We all have five senses, which are, I don't need to say, but maybe I will, sight, sound, smell, taste, touch. And these five senses are normally something that keep us safe. Because when we walk out in an environment, we see a threat <clears throat> or we're playing catch with our friends and we see a tree for home to be safe at home base, we can use our five senses to run and to get to the tree. Now, what Lucy has lacked, which what we all take for granted is our sixth sense. What is our sixth sense? Our sixth sense is joint proprioception. Lucy, you know what that means? Yeah. That means the ability to sense your finger in space. So this is zero degrees, this is 90 degrees. If I close my eyes and I pull my finger to that, and I asked myself or Lucy, how many degrees is this? Somebody with atlas danlos syndrome may say that it's 30 degrees when it's 45. And what that means is throughout life, even in childhood, when you're stepping downstairs or when you're running and playing catch, instead of stepping nice and flat, you might be twisted by just 10 degrees off. Mm. And therefore you land and you twist your ankles because your ankles are weak. Yes. I think and, that and you used to do that a lot, right? You come down the stairs, if you're not focused, you're distracted, you're speaking to mom or dad or your friends, you jump or bound down the stairs as most kids do, they land, they go, ouch. So from the very start, you've lost a sense of safety. Yeah. That sense of lack of safety in your body means that in extreme cases, people with EDS, may walk across a narrow door frame and wonder why the hell they didn't get out of the way because you hit your shoulder some people dislocate some people get hurt just coming out of doorways do all the time. you do that all the time even now yes okay so lucy is a case in point where with the eds and the impairment in joint hypermobility the coping mechanism needs to be something that allows lucy to be hyper aware and vigilant and the way to do that is to elevate the five senses. And you can imagine the way to do that is to elevate fright or flight or sympathetic nervous system response. And when you're flighty and frighty and you're not safe emotionally, mentally, and the lack of safety gives you this fright or flight, guess what? Your visual acuity is sharpened. Your hearing is sharpened. You can't stand being in a restaurant with clinking glasses and people laughing and shouting, you cannot stand a discotheque with the lights flashing because this is too much of a sensory overload for somebody who's already highly expressed in the five senses. So, the five senses hyper-expression doesn't, 
or the ad ad adrenaline surge from a frighty or flightiness, the lack of safety, the hyperadrenergic state, and the hypercortisol state yeah. over a chronic period, which doesn't necessarily measure abnormalities on any routine blood test, will prime you and your immune system. And imagine if now you are an animal, a gazelle grazing in a savanna, and a lion comes out from long grass, the immune system is primed by adrenaline to be hyperreactive. Because if you get scratched, if you are running away and you happen to get scratched, you want your platelets, you want your white cells, you want your histamine cells, which are mast cells, and you want your white cells and plasma cells to really react and come and seal that platelet and then have a huge inflammatory response to get your white cells to kill and extrude all the toxins, right? Right. Now, what does that mean in the context of somebody growing up with lack of safety, hyperadrenergic hyper states, yeah. hyperimmunity, the tendency to autoimmune conditions steps in, right? Yeah. And the autoimmunity, and just remind me, because I haven't read, do you have any autoimmune conditions? Um, I have endometriosis, which is argued now by some it's autoimmune, right, premenstrual right. dysphoric disorder, which right. they don't know what the etiology is, but it's right. autoimmune. I've got eye uveitis. Uveitis, okay. Any thyroid issues or not? Uh, no, but only because I take lots of supplements and when I'm it. I understand. Do you flush easily and do you oh my get God, yeah, So just if you just look at one, uh, a walking just, hot flush. Just, just look at the flushing in her chest. This is a very typical flush of somebody who has the tendency to mast cell activation. Yeah. And mast cell activation is a particular yeah. disorder that, that, that comes into play with EDS and dysautonomia because your mast cells are very sensitive and having any kind of stress sensitizes mast cells. And one way to think about it is when we blush, we get an emotional reaction, we get a surge of adrenaline and then we turn uh, bright red. The trouble with dysautonomia is that blood pressure regulation, part of the day-to-day -day homeostatic control of blood pressure and heart rate, which should be straightforward in most people, is slightly disordered, in fact, very disordered in somebody with EDS dysautonomia because you only need to stand up. Your blood pressure falls into your boots. Your blood vessels, which are already affected by EDS with the lack of collagen and to become so compliant, it's not stiff enough, starts to pull. So people with EDS have baggy blood vessels as if they're like balloons that have been blown a hundred times as opposed to nice tight bottles like a Coca-Cola bottle or a plastic bottle. So when Lucy stands up, unlike most with EDS, standing, gravity pulls blood from your head and your heart and parks it down there, but your balloon-like vessels just continue to accommodate. And so more blood goes down, you activate more adrenaline in a very highly primed adrenaline state already. Yeah. So one of the things that we find patients having is when you have a hot shower, and when Lucy has a hot shower, sometimes you get dizzy, tachycardic, you step out of the shower and you're all bright red. Yeah, yeah. Or you're flush red because you've activated those cells, you've activated those mast cells with the granulating in your chest, and you're getting dizzier and dizzier and more and more tachycardic. Yeah. So one top tip here is to have a cool off, ice cold uh, bit at the end, 10, 15, 20 seconds of cold, if not cold and cool, cooler at the end to yeah. try and vasoconstrict and bring the blood back to core. You already know this. But here's the other thing that makes sense. So we've talked about EDS giving you a sense of lack of safety, hyperadrenergic states over many years in childhood. That's really interesting. Priming yeah. yourself for the mental state that, an emotional state that always flicks around, almost like in a hyper acutely aware yeah. state. Yeah. So if you imagine uh, sound and sight being hyper aware, the moment you hear a sound, you're flicking around, you're flicking around. Mentally, you might also be very distractible, maybe. And the distractibility makes some believe the tendency to ADHD attention deficit hyperactivity disorder which is commonly also linked to eds to dysautonomia and to postural orthostatic tachycardia, yeah. tachycardia disorder. I, I have it but i've managed it 
over the years very well. I'm too tired to have ADHD. <laughs> sure, but what I'm trying to explain yeah. is give you a narrative that you build up yeah. from childhood because of the lack that, of yes. collagen. And very media. good. That's new, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And if that's information that you can then say, okay, this is why I have it, this is how, yeah. and the physiological and physical reasons why I'm experiencing what I'm yeah. experiencing, this is a phenomenal validation. Yeah. Because finally, not finally, you already knew this, but some of you watching will think and have been told cruelly by people that is all in your head, which is the worst thing for somebody who's experiencing physical symptoms to be told that is all in your head. When actually there is a physical cause, if you build up the argument like this over time, to, to give you the constellation of things you have 47 years after you're born, yeah. which you never quite understood. Interestingly, and this is not my data, data from Jessica Eccles, you can follow her, she is um, Paul on the Twitter handle, the Bendy Brain Doc, or the Bendy Brain, the Bendy Brain. And Jessica Eccles is a psychiatrist who is based in Brighton, who posits that patients who have this kind of tendency to hypermobility, dysautonomia, tend to gravitate towards arts, not science. Just because the creative uh, tendencies unleashed by this highly driven mm -hmm. autonomic state where you're picking things from everywhere. And again, your story is quite interesting because you started off quite sciencey in yeah. life but hated it. And you were in... Um, just, just remind us. Remind us. I what? was in a renewables division of renewables. a big old company. And and what did you stop? So what did you stop that and start to do? So then I became. I did something called amatsu, which is a Japanese form of osteopathy, a complementary therapy. So the the tendency to go and shift and really dislike sciency base. Uh, subjects into arty based subjects more creative uh, is one of the um, is one of the features or one of the characteristics that we start to recognize obviously not in everyone but in a significant proportion this is the path that most people take okay and so what can we do which is i guess the important question first of all <clears throat> acknowledging that is not in your head that validation and for those of you listening who have always thought what's going on, doctors say everything is normal, and so it must be me, it's not. There is a really valid explanation to why you might be experiencing the symptoms you are, which can all be explained fundamentally by having your collagen or EDS, Atlas Dano Syndrome or Hypermobility Syndrome, um, giving you this lack of proprioception, which starts off the whole lack of safety process from childhood age. The yeah. most important thing for a lot of people with EDS is validate, or any illness that is chronic, chronic and unexplained. Yeah, unexplained. Yeah. So I, I think here I just want to make a point that the validation is super important, and I want all of you listening to just understand that there is there is something that explains why you're feeling the way you're feeling and that there is a logical sequence that you can build up, and I hope this has been helpful. If I now take it a step further and say, what can we do? What Lucy has done, which has been most helpful, I want her to say it in her own words, has been actually, in my mind, to get to safety. But to get to safety without understanding the narrative today, she has had to deploy and learn certain strategies. So would you like to tell? Um, people, how how you how you've learned to cope with this, particularly on the validation front and safety. I've learned. Um, I'm still learning. I'm learning. Um, I do mindfulness or meditation or whatever the word is for you that suits you. That's what I do three, five, ten times a day. Um, I often fail completely at being still, but that's the nature of having this kind of chronic illness. I have moments where I'm very good at it, and then moments where it's a process just of helping me heal. But my main focus is always on forgiveness. Forgiveness of 
myself for being ill, forgiveness for everyone around when you have a chronic illness. And I look at other topics too, but that's what keeps me saying breathing, spirituality, and whatever word you want to use for meditation or prayer or mindfulness, whatever suits your and you also have quite a lot of counselling. Yes. Lucy too. I engage. I engage with the system and I accept. I take everything that's offered and then I work out what's right for me. And if I have that space in my mind, I can work out what's right for me and what's wrong and then be much more confident in that decision. How would you describe how you are, let's say on a scale subjectively of 1 to 10, before you engage with these practices and after you engage with these practices, how, how much progress have you made in general? Infinitesimal. I can't say the word. I'm a totally different person mm. than I was. Mm. And most people don't know how I am because I don't communicate that through my behaviours. Mm. Um, so, so, because so, I'm very calm most of the time, apart from when I'm in a hospital with John. Okay, so it's a substantial difference a huge that, that difference. is made. And yeah. how, how long has it taken for you to, to activate this difference, to feel the difference of those daily practices? Ten in, years. Hmm? Ten years. I've been seriously ten, ten years. ill ten years and okay. I've been seriously practising. Ten for, for 10 years. To stay alive. Okay. And that 10 years may seem very daunting, I guess, to people listening, because the question that will be asked, I'm sure, or for those of you listening, will be do I need to wait 10 years before I see yeah. that? No, because it, it comes slowly and, and daily with regular practice. It just comes 1 to 2% a day or after each practice, slowly, slowly. Correct? And, yes. And then you do get the odd big whoosh just to keep you satisfied. Mm. Where you'll get a big jump of some wow. I feel okay. totally different. Okay. And then because you've got a chronic illness, you'll feel really ill and forget about that completely. Yeah. So it's really important to try and manage the chaos within a chronic illness because it comes very small and you will often, I often forget the improvements and that's why John and I do the notes Perfect. and we keep track. So, so what, what Lucy does is makes a phenomenal point that we are always focused, we tend to be as human beings focused on the present pain and suffering that we have. We forget that after a breath session, for example, on a calm Sunday morning, after a really quiet Saturday with lots of sleep, that you can have what she calls a whoosh, what I call a clunk. And that's an autonomic shift state where you shift from sympathetic cortisol suddenly to parasympathetic, that you might be able to get into more and more as you practice. So maybe when you start, maybe one in 20 times you'll feel this whoosh or clunk. But when you practice more and more, maybe it's 1 in 10, 1 in 5. And on a bad period, maybe 1 in 50. So you can breathe and practice 50 times. You might only feel the clunk once, and it might only last for two hours. But here's the thing, know you can shift. And when you shift even for 10 minutes or two hours, know that you've done something and you have agency or control of your autonomic nervous system by practicing what she did. Look, what she's mentioned is nothing to do with drugs or any supportive therapy that, that we, would, we would ask her to do, like salt and water. She's purely mentioning a shift in her framework of existence and of looking at forgiveness, for example. She said forgiveness was a big one. And I think forgiving self is a huge aspect of healing because when you do that, something about you lightens up. Your autonomic nervous system state may shift from fear, from a fear state. And fear, as you know, triggers the adrenaline surge. So we need to try and understand the complex interplay and even our expectations. There's something else that maybe I want to bring up for Lucy. If Maybe she hasn't expressed it and maybe she will. 
But I often find an expectation gap is one of the biggest things that sets people back. So you get ill with COVID or you go through a 14 year old puberty spurt and because you've got all this preconditioning with EDS, you suddenly get unwell with either chronic fatigue or, or dysautonomic symptoms. And it happens like that. So you think something happened, i.e. the damn COVID virus, the damn puberty spurt, the stressful event at school or the change in jobs or the horrible boss or the spouse that doesn't understand. This is super important that you grab hold of the understanding that it's not any of those singular events that has led to this state, right? It's actually a multitude of building up stressors that has led to this threshold point at which one trigger will send you over the edge or it seemingly feels like this. But it's never the one trigger. It's never the one trigger. And you know, this is what you're saying as well. But this is what a lot of patients don't really accept or cannot accept because I was perfectly fine till I had COVID or till I had uh, I, I lost my job or till I failed my exams. I didn't understand the impact of the proprioception till you gave me the narrative, but I knew the other emotional and work. Right. The cumulative, but I hadn't put together how hard it was for me. Yeah. So the proprioception is a physical aspect that sets you back. And, you know, this, this coming away from the anger of the lack of understanding of the people around you and so forgiveness to self is important but forgiveness to your physicians or to the people you've seen your physiotherapists your physicians everyone you've seen and, and lucy has seen many many people probably 20 in or maybe more no. but you're actively seeing now 10 people now but some of these consultants or physicians or allied health professionals may not get you, may not understand you. And if they are pressed for time and they have a 10 minute consult, you have to forgive them because they may not know this narrative and they certainly don't know your body as well as you do. And the lack of their understanding doesn't make it, doesn't mean that you don't have an illness. You have an illness and you have an illness that's fully explained. So I want you to take away from this that actually there are facets of healing that sit from within here, your heart, your emotional heart, but which can resonate up and connect with your mind or brain in terms of how you think and feel about yourself. Because the autonomic center, which is part of your primitive brain, will connect to your heart and give you tachycardia and palpitations and blood pressure fluctuations. But if you reverse that and give yourself a calm emotional state, Equally, the autonomic nervous system can give you that whoosh, that clunk into a parasympathetic state to make life much more bearable. I just have to end, I know I've gone on quite a long now, but I have to end by saying there are useful things you can do. One is to do what's called an active stand test. This is something that Lucy has done repeatedly on a, on a meticulously charted um, Excel spreadsheet, which I'll try and bring up, which maybe you can focus on here. Thank you, Liz. And this is simply charting what Lucy has done here. Sitting, blood pressure at 1041, at 109 over 93, pulse rate of 85 beats per minute. When she stands at 1044, her blood pressure goes up to 136 over 82, but look at the pulse rate, it's jumped to 111. And as she stands seven minutes after seated, the heart rate jumps to 118 and 106 from a baseline of 85. And this shows that Lucy is activating her sympathetic nervous system whenever she stands and because that leads to the heart rate rise and it's no wonder she feels unwell with dizziness, palpitations and very exhausted. This is still being activated whenever Lucy stands up. The solution is not to never stand up or lie in bed all day, that would be not good. You must try and hydrate and make sure you understand the mechanics of hydration with salt and isotonic electrolyte drinks. So three liters a day front loaded with 10 grams of salt, which are two teaspoonfuls, or take a tablet like ORS, Science in Sport SIS, or Noon, N-U-U-N. Put a, put a tablet in cold water and drink it before you stand up at the start of the day. That could be very helpful. Grade two graded compression that you wear from your toes or ankles all the way to your waist to squeeze your blood vessels. 
can also be helpful. Abdominal compression that you can also buy, which goes around and wraps around your splanchnic bed, your tummy, and the blood vessels in your tummy to squeeze it with a Velcro, which you can get on Amazon, for example. Everyday medical umbilical hernia belt is what you might search. And you might just wear that as, as tightly as you can bear with if you can't bear the compression. Or you can wear both because the trials have been done to show acutely that if you wear one, it's good. If you wear both, it's even better to keep your blood pressure maintained and to keep the fluid coming back to your heart so you don't always activate that pooling of blood and adrenaline response. As a doctor, what we would prescribe sometimes in a patient like Lucy is our drugs that will augment your blood pressure or filling if she has tried fluid salt compression and isometric counterpressure exercises like clenching your glutes, your quads, your calves, and actually sitting properly. When I say properly, I mean sitting with your legs crossed a bit like that and fidgeting because when you fidget and you sit cross-legged, you are activating your calf muscles, your quad muscles to push the blood back up. So there are ways to sit. Sitting like this, squeezing your muscles down like this hard may also be a suitable way to squeeze the blood and push it back up into the heart. Eating light meals, which are not carb heavy, not stodgy, so not a pasta bolognese or a, a jacket potato, but more a light salad with a drizzle of um, olive oil with tuna or chicken uh, breast on top uh, may be a better way to eat rather than having large volume meals. Uh, grazing, i.e. small frequent meals might be helpful and salty snacks like nuts might be helpful. And those are the kind of top conservative tips to help get you uh, physically primed for being able to tolerate being upright. Clearly the other aspect that she talked about, breath work, forgiveness work, emotional work, counseling work, are things that I won't belabor, but is what Lucy has already spoken about. The other aspect that I would say you might need a physician for is drugs. So if you do your active stand, your blood pressures are always in the hundreds or the 90s systolic, the top value always low, and you're still getting a heart rate rise of more than 30 beats a minute when you stand up for say five or seven minutes, and you feel symptomatic, you might want to see your GP and consider starting a drug to augment your blood pressure like midodrine or fluticortisone. And after we end, I'm going to have a consultation with Lucy to discuss those potential treatment options because Lucy's done extremely well with the conservative strategies. We need to make her feel better. And maybe with these blood pressures, which are a bit on the low side, I don't mind prescribing these medications, which may be able to help. Finally, consider antihistamines as a trial. If you're the type of patient who stands in a shower, gets flushed red, or stands up and for no reason flushes red, or particularly you're lying in bed at night and you wake up with palpitations, not understanding why, but you're flushed, you could have a mast cell degranulation event where your histamine is hitting your, your skin and your splanchnic bed and you're vasodilating, i.e. you're losing blood even whilst lying down. That curious um, type of symptom when you're sleeping, you wake up with palpitations, can often be helped with a nocturnal dose of antihistamine such as sertirizine 10 milligrams at night, which you can buy off the counter, or fexofenadine 180 milligrams, uh, which may need pres prescription. And on that note, I may not have anything else to uh, say, but thank you for listening.